My name is Alan Hopper. I am with the ACLU of Northern California. I'm the Criminal Justice and Drug Policy Director there and uh, am uh, interested and focused on drug policy and, and medical marijuana, mostly from the perspective of a lawyer. I've litigated medical marijuana cases um, for many years now in uh, state and federal courts, including uh, uh, with Lyle Craker, who will be here later this afternoon, uh, challenging the DEA uh, to allow him to grow medical marijuana, to provide it to researchers who want to take marijuana through the uh, FDA approval process. Uh, and am uh, moderating today. So we will be uh, here for the next hour uh, with um, our next panelists. Uh, at noon, we'll take a break for about an hour, and we'll come back at 1 o'clock. And uh, this afternoon, uh, have uh, some really interesting folks lined up to talk a little bit more about the science. And so this is a nice segue from the politics uh, that we've heard mostly about this morning uh, to, uh, to the science. And um, we have now this afternoon uh, or I'm sorry, for the rest of the morning, uh, Martin Lee and Fred Gardner, and I will let them introduce themselves to you uh, in more detail. Um, uh, Fred is a journalist who's covered these issues for many, many years. Uh, Martin is an author. He wrote a book called Acid Dreams, which was one of my um, uh, favorite books in college that really helped uh, begin to politicize me around these issues of, of drug policy. Um, so it's an honor to be here uh, with both of you. And uh, they are going to be talking with us about a project that they have been working on called Project CBD. And I will let them describe that to you in more detail. Okay. Well, I'm going to speak for a few minutes first, and then I'm going to hand it over to Fred. Um, when talking about CBD, we're talking about cannabidiol. For starters, that's a non-psychoactive compound in the cannabis plant. Generally, it's the second most prevalent compound. THC tends to be most prevalent, then afterwards CBD. Uh, but there are many more cannabinoids uh, in the cannabis plant, over 100. And we're interested in all of them. We're not just interested in CBD, but there's particular reasons why we're interested in CBD, and that'll come out today. We want to talk a little bit about the science. I will talk about the medical science. Fred is going to talk more about what's happening on the grassroots today, because CBD, lo and behold, is available now in the grassroots mix. Um, so we look at CBD as a molecule, a medicine, and also as a myth buster, because as a non-psychoactive compound that has tremendous, and italicize the word tremendous, medical potential, uh, it has political implications as well, because uh, of all the myths about marijuana and, and the, the, the edifice of prohibition, as shaky as it is, some people still cling to this notion that the psycho psychoactivity of cannabis is what's bad about it. And that's why it's dangerous, and you shouldn't go near it. And that's why it produces psychosis, allegedly, and all these other things. So uh, when you come back at him with, well, what about this CBD in marijuana? What about this uh, non-psychoactive compound that actually tends to counteract and neutralize the effect of THC? So that if they're both in the plant and CBD is more prevalent, uh, you won't f experience something that, that you, what you ordinarily experience as a typical cannabis high. It'll be very, very different. It might not be a high at all. It might be relaxing, but not intoxicating. And that presents certain strategic advantages for some people because the, the surveys show that of, of all, about half the people in this country will end up smoking pot or trying it sometime in their life. Of those, uh, almost 10%, a little less, tend to become everyday users. Uh, more, more than that percentage will be occasional users. But a lot of people try cannabis and they don't use it again. They don't like the experience. They don't like the experience of being high, that relaxed intensity, the mellow swoony headedness that personally I find very nice, but a lot of people find very uncomfortable or very unpleasant. Well, you're talking about an enormous number of people in that category. If only 10% are the regular users, the everyday users, I would call that the medical users. What about the 90% who try it and don't become med uh, regular users? Well, does that mean that they sort of, we just write them off, okay, well, medical marijuana is not for them? Well, that would be a pity given how uh, many different uh, conditions and diseases for which cannabis is proven to be good for. Uh, and it would be a pity if all these people who don't like the experience of being high can't access those benefits. All right, a little bit on the medical science. Um, CBD, cannabidiol, was first elucidated its chemical structure by Dr. Raphael Meshulam, Israeli scientist, in 1963. A year later, his team at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem also uh, identified, elucidated the chemical structure of THC and, and were the first to synthesize THC. 
So CBD was actually looked at before, uh, and since that time, or at least initially after that, there wasn't a lot of research into CBD. A little bit into, in Israel, a little bit in Brazil. They found that it was, uh, uh, showed great potential as an anti-convulsant for epilepsy. The early studies showed early studies showed uh, uh, antipsychotic, anti-anxiety uh, effects, but for the most part, 1963 afterwards, scientists were tending to focus more on THC, and the uh, uh, you know, socially what people were, were focusing on was was, was uh, at least from the drug warrior perspective, it was all about the the terrible menace of cannabis. But CBD kind of got shuffled to the side, and it really wasn't until. The major breakthrough occurred in the late 1980s when the first cannabinoid receptor in the brain was discovered. And then a few years later, a second receptor, CB1, in the brain and central nervous system. As a result of that, that's why cannabis is psychoactive, because it plugs into those receptors and activates and stimulates them. There's also CB2 in the periphery. Uh, THC plugs into both. THC into, CB2, into CB2 excuse me, is not psychoactive. That's not what makes you high, but it is medicinal. So uh, after the discovery of these receptors and the discovery of some of the endogenous compounds in our own brain and body that plug into these receptors, uh, there was a great deal, of, a burst of scientific research. Up until that time, you know, so reefer madness really put a damper on the research into cannabis. But once the endocannabinoid system was discovered, there was a great deal of research all around the world, mainly preclinical, test tube, petri dish, rat brains, and so forth. But there was, I think since that time, about 20,000 papers have been published dealing with the endocannabinoid system, which entails, well, to be very simple about it, the receptors in the brain and body that respond pharmacologically to cannabis, and the endogenous chemicals in ourselves that plug into those receptors, and also the enzymes in our body that regulate the levels of our own cannabinoids. That's very, very key, these particular enzymes that are involved in the creation of our own cannabinoids and the, the breakdown of them. And there's more to it than that, but scientists are looking at this and they're finding, I mean, essentially, in a nutshell, what, what, what it shows is a, a, a real powerful validation of medical marijuana. It, it really provides a scientific basis for medical marijuana. We hear often, well, there hasn't been enough research, the, the, the other side tells us. We don't know, you know, if marijuana really works or not. There hasn't been the studies. There has been so much research, again, mainly preclinical, but some clinical also. That, that is just not true. That is not true at all. So what we do at Project CBD is we report on uh, what's going on in the scientific community, this really nuts and bolts, somewhat arcane research that's discussed in scientific papers and at conferences. Uh, and we report on what's going on, report this information to the medical community, to the doctors who are not well schooled in this. Doctors generally do not learn about the endocannabinoid system in medical school, you know, because we didn't know about this. Yeah, not that long ago. Um, and to patients and to the general public. Uh, we have a flyer about this. Uh, Maybe we're our, gonna our colleague, yes, Sarah, Sarah Russo. Might. Sarah, raise your hand. Excuse me. Outreach um, coordinator of Project CBD will now outreach to you with our brochure. Exactly. <laughs> so it, it sort of shuns, uh, sums up in a nutshell uh, s some of the things about uh, uh, CBD. But uh, I was fortunate enough, uh, thanks to my friendship with Fred, who really opened the door. Uh, Fred had been covering these conferences of the International Cannabinoid Research Society and a few other organizations where scientists, hundreds of them from all over the world, from every continent, will come and discuss their latest research into their particular area where they're looking at CBD and THC and synthetic cannabinoids that have been created in laboratories that plug into these receptors and so forth. And they, and they talk about their research as it pertains to many, many different areas of medical science. It's amazing what's going on. Um, you'll hear you, uh, just amazing stuff. Uh, and what became very striking, to me at least, when I would go to these conferences, that if there was a star of the show, it was CBD, it was cannabinoid that, that, that really emerged as sort of the hot thing, that is the hot compound. Um, why? Well, what the scientists, just to give you a taste, and I can't go into too much detail, I'll refer you to our website, it's, it's printed on there where we have a lot more research uh, and, and reports on there, but uh, the kind of things that the uh, scientists were finding uh, with respect to, uh, uh, they found that CBD, in and of itself, as a molecule, was very, very effective for certain conditions. I'll give you an example. This just came in this week. 
Uh, cannabidiol as an antiarrhythmic, the role of the CB1 receptors. That's a report from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. It's just this week. There is no big pharma drug that's applicable for a heart arrhythmia. There is none that is safe. I know that because I used to have that condition. I don't anymore. Uh, but there is none that is safe. Uh, all, the ones that they use are extremely dangerous and toxic. Uh, this is a condition that's very prevalent in our society. As you grow older, it's more and more likely you're going to have heart arrhythmia on and off or maybe permanently. It's also a very dangerous condition. Here you have CBD. It's not the first study that has shown that it stops arrhythmia in a rat, you know, in, a, in, a, in a control setting. So uh, you have uh, examples otherwise. Uh, neuropathic pain. CBD, tremendous for neuropathic pain. That's pa pain resulting from nerve damage. That's peripheral nerve pain. Opiates do not help uh, 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 that kind of pain. Marijuana does. Uh, high THC marijuana does too, but CBD combined with THC, that's the best they found. Um, I can give many other examples, maybe just a couple more, in terms of how astonishing and jaw-breaking, uh, jaw, jaw dropping, I should say, that the science is. We wouldn't want to break our jaws. <laughs> um, but uh, mad cow disease, CBD stops it in a test tube. It stops these infectious prion related de diseases. It's a French study that came out with this. Also, the, MR, uh, the uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, I think it's MSRS, MSRH, yes, yes. yes. Uh, several cannabinoids, and it, again, in a test tube, will stop this stuff, including CBD. The best one is actually a different compound, CBG it's called, cannabigerol. Um, anyway, uh, as we report on what's going on with the science, you know, one thing that really comes out strongly, and a point to make, I can, really want to emphasize this, is that while CBD shows a lot of potency as a, as a molecule, in, in different experimental settings, when they make experimental models of a whole range of different diseases, uh, it, uh, it, it always works best in combination with THC. Same thing with THC. For example, at the Pacific Medical Center just across the bay here, they've done extensive research uh, with CBD and THC and, and breast cancer and brain cancer. Uh, and they found, you know, it's amazing the work. Expose uh, breast cancer, it, again, in, in vitro, it's, it's, it's uh, cell lines. They're not working on uh, people who are living, but they, they keep these cells alive after people die, and they work with them, and they find CBD is the most potent against brain cancer and breast cancer in and of itself. It's more potent than even THC, but when combined together, and that's the key thing here. Um, you know, there's a lot one could say about uh, CBD. I hope you'll look at the website. I'm going to hand it over to Fred shortly to talk about what's happening on the grassroots, because you know, we go to these conferences and we talk among ourselves, and we always remark how, gee, isn't it strange that we're the only journalists here? How come this, th these are incredible discoveries they're talking about? You know, and, and it's not being covered in the mainstream media. And if, if the mass media would really cover cannabinoid science, I don't see how prohibition can continue, because the science is so powerful and such a validation for the medical use of marijuana that, that, that there's no debate about the science. You know, when it's presented in, in a clear, accessible way, uh, and that's what we're tr one of the things we're trying to do at Project CBD. Uh, there's other things we're doing, but I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Fred. Can, can I just ask a sure. question, Martin? Um, just to clarify. So I, I hear you, uh, as I understood your last point, um, that the combination of THC with CBD is actually often showing the best results. And what I'm wondering is, are, are, is all, all of these studies that you guys are, um, are reporting on, are they whole plant marijuana that has been bred to have higher or lower levels of the different uh, cannabidiols and, and THC, or are there extracts? So what I'm trying to figure out is, is it, are, 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 are you certain that it's the combination of THC with CBD, or might it be something else that's going on with the other constituent parts of the plant that we, that we haven't isolated and figured out yet? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, should I do it quickly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, two ways you can get CBD. It can be synthesized in a laboratory, uh, as it, uh, is, uh, and it's available and made available to researchers around the world who have permission in their countries to work with uh, a cannabinoid. Um, same thing with THC. We know we, it's THC been isolated. It's available uh, as, mar uh, as Marinol. Uh, so there's two, uh, and then you can also get it as a whole plant extract from G GW Pharmaceuticals, a uh, uh, pharmaceutical company, it's, 
it's, an, it's a very atypical pharmaceutical company because they're working with whole plant extract from the cannabis plant. And they can, um, you know, they can change the extract. They can, they can kind of tailor it with more CBD, less CBD. They can use other, uh, you know. Uh, but basically, it, their main product, Sativex, which is available as a medicine in, and in Canada and, and many countries in Europe, is pretty much a 50-50 combination CBD, THC, with a little sprinkling of the rest. And the rest being not just cannabinoids, but terpenes, flavonoids, all these things have medicinal attributes. And the, the point that, that we always make strongly at Project CBD, it, it, we defend the whole plant, it, because you could take these separate compounds and you can add them all up all the terpenes, the flavonoids, the, the cannabinoids, uh, but it's the whole plant that has the uh, greater therapeutic impact than the sum total of the individual components, all of which are individually important. And there's research being done on a whole bunch of them, and it's quite fascinating. So in answer to your question, at, at the Pacific Medical Center, they took synthetic CBD, synthetic TB, uh, uh, THC, and, and uh, experimented with those. So it was very clearly, it, it was a combination of the two of them that was working. Uh, I brought this book. I didn't know if it would be relevant, but this is right on topic. I, this is a 1928 Oxford University Press, A Short History of Medicine. Very established. And there's a, ch a, a section called Active Principles. One of the things that separate the practice of medicine of our time from that of previous ages is of our power to do give drugs in pure form. This means not only that we can secure drugs without adulteration, but also that the active substances in drugs can be chemically isolated and given without admixture. Most drugs used in medicine are in fact of vegetable origin. The possibility of giving them in chemically pure form depends upon the discovery early in the 19th century that plants owe their poisonous and remedi remedial properties to small quantities of active principles which are susceptible of chemical extraction and isolation. And um, that kind of sums up the paradigm of modern pharmacology and medicine, that within in the plant there is an active ingredient. Usually, and this, it's usually, the, the, the paradigm is the active ingredient. It's not even two or three. Even though they realized that the first one to be isolated was morphine from uh, opium by a, a German druggist named Sturturner. In the 18, eight, early 19th century, 1803, 1806, somewhere in, in there. And that, and that from, you know, quinine from Quinchona and uh, digitalis from Foxglove and all the, the medicines, the active ingredients were found, isolated, and sold as medicines, and people didn't have to worry about ground up bark and powders and tinctures from the plants themselves. And that, that, that's been the uh, dominant paradigm, as they say, for, for a long, long time, and uh, it's it's only it's only through the intense study of cannabis in the last few decades that that paradigm itself has been challenged, and the importance of of the the synergy of active ingredients uh, has has been brought out. And it makes sense if you think in terms of of a plant co-evolving with people, which we we know that cannabis. Has and it's being bred to be to help the woman with menstrual cramps, the people with pain. Then another kind is being grown for fiber and oil from the seeds, and so one has a dominant cannabinoid. Hemp has CBD as the dominant cannabinoid. Uh, the one we know as marijuana, bred for the resin, has uh, THC as the dominant cannabinoid, and. In California, where marijuana has been bred for many generations of growers and more generations of plants for high THC content, CBD has been reduced because of a genetic either or. And when, when I, I've, in, in, at the 1998 meeting of the International Cannabinoid Research Society, when I first heard, learned about CBD, it was from uh, Jeffrey Guy, the MD and pharmaceutical entrepreneur who had just gotten British Home Office approval to develop a, a THC CBD combo for clinical trials. And 
the key, key arguments that Guy made to the Home Office were it's not going to be, it's going to be in non-smokable form, They're formulating it for uh, uh, under the tongue spray, and it's, it's probably not going to be psychoactive, and it's certainly not going to be as psychoactive as the high THC marijuana that's around now, because we're going to be using, it's going to be 50 percent uh, cannabidiol. And they, the, the way they, they make it is they grow their high CBD plants outdoors like hemp, and they grow their high THC plants in glass houses at an undisclosed location in southeast England, and they blend them and macerate them, and they've developed a product that can be uh, reproducible. The key, sell the key selling point as they approach the FDA is that the 37th batch of Sativex that they manufacture is going to be identical with the 3037th batch. So th that's the key, um, that's the, the hurdle that they have to jump over, exact reproducibility. And um, recently, um, the medical director of GW Pharmaceuticals, Ethan Russo, gave a paper um, call, uh, emphasizing that cannabis works by an entourage, the compounds in cannabis work by exerting an entourage effect. They, they both cumulatively, they each have certain medicinal properties and synergistically they magnify their um, curative effect. And the door is, it, it, the single active ingredient paradigm is over. For a while we thought it was, it, there were two key components, CBD and THC, and I, I myself uh, probably pushed that concept in O'Shaughnessy, the uh, paper I put out for pro cannabis doctors group. So for maybe five or ten years there was the thought of THC and CBD being a duo. It's not a, it's not a solo act, it's a duet. But even, and now Russo's uh, new approach indicates it's more than that. It's a band. It's a choir. It's, it's a treasure tro pharmacological treasure trove, as he puts it, in the plant. And um, when, I, when I heard Guy give his presentation in, in 98, I, I, I interviewed him afterwards and I said, well, you know, in California we have no government approval and we don't have any analytic labs testing to find out what we've got, but what are the chances that there are CBD strains in California? And he said, and many other experts told me subsequently, that the chances were zero to slim because of this um, gen genetic propensity to, for CBD to vanish when you're building up the THC levels. And uh, in 2006, 2007, um, the Harborside Health Center here in Oakland uh, decided to back two um, amateurs, erstwhile growers, who understood the important how much the industry needed a lab. And uh, they trained they trained themselves. They studied under uh, somebody who really knew what they were doing, and they mastered enough uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, to be able to begin to test for cannabinoid content. Get drinks. For some reason, I have dry mouth. <laughs> <laughs> what causes that? You know, Fred made a reference to uh, the genetics of uh, THC increasing in the grassroots and CBD decreasing. And that was a conscious effort on the part of breeders to make a more stonier feel to the to the herb. Uh, that's what people. Presume people want it, so that's the way it went in terms of the breeding. But as Fred will point out, there's a little more to it than that. So, in uh, the, when, we, when I came back and started spreading the news, I, I worked closely with Todd Micaria, the uh, doctor who had founded a, uh, a group of pro cannabis doctors. And from the time of our first issue in 2000, the first issue of our journal O'Shaughnessy's in 2003, we described where GW is at, where the European scientists were at, and we longingly expressed the desire, if only we could get some CBD, high CBD cannabis 
and see if, if it really does have different effects. And Dale Gearinger had made one for a, he, he himself realized the significance of testing long before the industry decided to back it and made one guerrilla effort to, uh, to collect 50 samples, I believe, and had them tested and uh, I get, I'll let Dale elaborate. One sample had amazingly high levels of CBD, but almost all of the 50 samples had less than 0.1%, basically. The one sample that had amazingly high levels of CBD, I think it had 23%, it was crazy. We were never able to replicate again. The grower didn't know where he got it from, and it was lost. So basically the story was we can't get high CBD pot. That was back around 2000. Do they kind of work inversely? Like the THC and CBD, I mean, is it always one is high and one is low? No, 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 no. Okay, because that just kind of seems, from what I've been hearing, I think it's an either or at the genetic level in terms of the, how it's going to be expressed. But in terms of the total quantity, there are 50, 50 there's uh, several strains now that are 50 50. They're, the next generation of those have, it's all, it's all over the map. But the, they don't play off of each other. They don't, that's my understanding. That they, well, uh, actually, GW has uh, the advantage of having access to a lot of uh, germplasms. Yes, and definitely in Morocco, and hashish, the, in Europe, the hashish that's coming from Morocco and Afghanistan very often has high CBD levels, and that, and as as a result, some uh, tests that are done in Europe are very different than equivalent tests done in the U.S. Um, anyway, okay, getting back to the the history of how how we tried to get this into the pipeline. Um, it was a very uh, important step that Harborside took in, in backing the Steep Hill Lab. And, and when they did, uh, as, the, uh, as they were ramping up, they identified a, C, a high CBD strain grown in Co up near Covalo in Mendocino County. But because they themselves didn't understand the significance of CBD, they're, they're, and they were still learning the craft, by the time they notified that grower, she no longer had access to the seeds that, that it had come from. It's a, my hat, I have nothing but the utmost respect for plant breeders and the meticulous record keeping that they have to do. It takes a certain kind of personality to label and save every seed um, and, and really know what you do. It, it, they, that's hard work, serious uh, plant breeders. Um, deserve uh, uh, our, our thanks for developing these strains of interest. Um, okay, so, in two, so starting in 2007-2008, um, CBD-rich strains were being identified. And the, there's another player in this story, the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, which is the group that Micaria founded and is still going strong. And this is the, the more serious doctors um, the, the doc, doctors in this field have gotten very bad press. They're dismissed as pot docs and quacks and profiteers. And if, yes, I, there is one end of the spectrum with people like that. But at the other end of the spectrum are the best doctors in the world, doctors devoted to their patients. And, um, and of course, they're very interested in the medical potential of CBD-rich strains. So in concert with the doctors from this side of cannabis clinicians, we decided to arbitrarily define CBD-rich cannabis as 4% CBD by weight or more. There's nothing um, 
magical that happens at the 4% level, but we wanted to begin the data collection process. We had to have a, even though this is very crude and very rough and very approximate, we, we had to distinguish between CBD-rich cannabis and high THC cannabis. So without respect to the THC level, without respect to the CBD to THC ratio, we said we're interested in tracking any strains that are more than 4% CBD. And uh, I'll, I'll read you headlines from O'Shaughnessy's over, over the last four years. If you, but, well, in, two, in 2007, this was a survey, a 10-year survey of pro-cannabis doctors looked at all their patient records and saw what it was being used for. It's a quite, quite interesting range of conditions. And of course, the big news also underplayed in the mass media is that people using cannabis can get off other drugs. They can, get, they can reduce their opiate use. They can reduce their antidepressant use. I personally think this is a big factor in why big pharma is, is opposed the legalization of cannabis. I don't think we, I think they work carefully behind the scenes. They've obviously got unlimited funds and it's like, it's like an invisible force. I liken it to the, to the to a force pulling a planet out of its orbit. People say, well, why is Obama breaking his promises as if there's some force pulling him nobody can quite identify? But I suspect it's the pharmaceutical industry. Anyway, quickly uh, through these headlines. 2008, CBD terpenes, the CBD2 re receptor, new findings. THC isn't the only active cannabinoid, and cannabinoids aren't the only active compounds in the cannabis plant researchers have found. The plot thickens. 2009, labs start testing cannabis. High CBD strains identified. 2010, doctors to study effectiveness of CBD. And this includes the first crude survey that it really the launch of project introducing project CBD and we say our collective is involved in a research project to assess the effects of strains relatively rich in cannabidiol more than four percent CBD collective members who medicate with CBD rich cannabis are encouraged to take part in this research by reporting your observations on the back of this form and this was a little questionnaire designed for participating dispensaries for the bud tenders to hand to patients who were purchasing CBD rich strains. And we thought very important that these bud tenders be educated and brought up to speed on CBD because that's where the rubber meets the road. It's when the person at the dispensary is talking to the patient, who's describing their symptoms. That's a very important role. And these people, depending on the management of the dispensary, these people can either be treated as retail clerks who are not too important in the whole. Just uh, replaceable or serious participants in this collective research effort. Um, and then um, Project CBD was formed. I'm not, not even sure how and, and where we, we didn't. You're we, crazy. There was, there, was no <laughs> clink, there was no clinking of champagne glass. It, 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 it just evolved. Martin and I have been covering the conferences and as he said, why isn't this word getting out? Where is the New York Times? Where's the San Francisco Chronicle? You know, this is a, 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 a this, the medical marijuana is a, is a local story here for us in the Bay Area, and it's really shameful the the extent to which the Chronicle has ignored. It would almost be as if the Atlanta Constitution in the early '60s was not covering sit-ins and not covering the civil rights movement. They occasionally there'll be a, a cannabis-related story, almost always uh, related to a legal case or an electoral situation. No coverage of the science. So um, we've been uh, we've created a website. Uh, Sarah Russo has uh, been in touch with dispensaries, urging them to participate in Project CBD uh, to support our work and to help us in the data collection effort. Oh, and in 2008, there's a, there is a CBD-rich grower in, in the room. I don't know if he wants to identify himself, but uh, I made it my business in this period when people didn't quite know what CBD was. I told the um, buyers at a couple of local dispensaries, I said, if, you ever, if your lab results ever come in with high in CBD, please 
call, try and put me in touch with the client so that I can explain to them what they've got. And this happened five or six times in 2008, and I had the great experience of telling five or six growers that not to be disappointed if the dispensary didn't want their medicine. We thought their medicine was great and it was going to have a great future. And we shared with them what we had gleaned from the scientists. And now um, CBD-rich medicine is entering the pipeline more and more. And more. Um, clones are for sale in several dispensaries. Uh, processed medicine is available. One seed company that we know of, Sohum, in um, Humboldt County is selling seaweed rich seeds. They've had uh, problems stabilizing the strain, so sometimes you'll be getting one in four seaweed rich when you when you buy their their seed packets. So, um, have I? Have I? You carry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, for, for, how much time do we have, by the way? Just right, we've got about fifteen to oh. about seventeen minutes, something like that. Yeah, please feel free to ask yeah, questions. I, yeah, we've got about what, uh, seventeen minutes. So there's a load to say, but why don't we do it? Uh, we'll go around the room. Yeah. Please. So, what is one of the highest CBD strains that you know of that are local to the area around here? The top three. <laughs> Well, it's cha it's in flux because, the, as I say, the next I'll take an example of a strain called uh, Amrita. Um, Am Amrita RX, right? Or Amrita, Amrita. Now, now known as Amrita RX. It was originally the the parent plants were called Fucking Incredible, and not just not incredible, Fucking Incredible. That was a lot, and Romulan. And um, when the grower realized what he had, and he's very committed to medical use. He himself is a young person who's had a terrible uh, ad, uh, injury, and it was major back problems, and he had, no, he had used this strain himself because he realized how good it was for his own problem. And I kept, I heard this from a couple of these CBD growers, that they themselves liked the strain not for its psychoactivity, but for its anti-inflammatory effects. It's helped with their back problems. And um, he, this, was, this was one of three strains that initially tested at about three to two CBD to THC ratio. The levels were eight, eight and five, nine and six, in that area. And they were Amrita RX3, its new name, um, Harlequin, and Jamaican lime. And all of these strains had the same CBD to THC ratio, and they all seemed to be slightly different, but different effects. Um, obviously, the terpenes are playing a significant role. Uh, but to answer your question, in the next generation, so I would have answered it one way at the time, I would have said it was a strain called Blue Jay Whey, uh, which we had tested at 14%. We put it in here. But the next generation of Amrita has an 18 to 1 CBD to THC ratio, one variety from that next generation. And Canatonic, same yeah. thing. There's now a doctor in LA named Frankel who is mad for CBD. And Dr. Courtney also uh, pushing it. Um, and so, so there's now going to be, a, there are going to be strains for which may be truly non-psychoactive and strong in CBD. Um, offspring of Amrita, offspring of Canatonic, um, offspring of Harlequin. That's the ones that are very high CBD to very low THC. That's one phenotype of, of the offspring that you might find. Uh, the same offspring, something 18% THC and hardly any CBD. But uh, we want to keep going around the room. You had a question? Northern California one that's available now is Sour Tsunami. Yes. It's like 15 to 17, and then with CBD, and I think 4 to 5 with the DC. Like uh, local current yeah. Life. I wouldn't get too hung up on the numbers themselves. You know, the higher number isn't necessarily the better number. I think the ratio is probably more significant than the number. You can always take a couple extra puffs, you know, if you want to get more. But the ratio is really, I think, more significant. Yes, um, in the back. Yeah, since we're essentially avoiding the psychotropic side of THC by administering the CBD, doesn't it seem like if people got away from decarboxylation and stopped exposing 
exposing the plant to heat and started just eating the plant or you know getting exposed to THC acid, couldn't that help facilitate more therapy versus avoiding these side effects that are really just inherent to delta 9? You don't want to say something about that? Well, Dr. Ford being up in Mendocino, if you do some research into him, he is a big proponent of juicing the fresh plant. Okay. That is what he does, and he is having tremendous success with patients with all sorts of different types. There's a little baby who was sent home on hospice with brain cancer, who died, that started juicing the fresh plant, that now it's been a year, and she's... I mean, she's messed up. She can't have radiation anymore. She has no teeth. Like, she wobbles when she walks, but she's alive and she's starting to communicate and talk. So, if people really don't want the psychoactivity and you live in California, you should grow your own plants and juice them. You know, when you juice a plant, when you take it that way, you're, you're the, the most uh, medicinal aspect, it's an acid form. It's CBD acid, THC acid. And the, Icarus, the International Cannabinoid Research Society Conference, they discuss the acids, uh, virgins, and indeed they've uh, demonstrated medicinal properties. I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, it means that's better than another way. There's many ways to. Dis uh, to uh, Just as far as dosage is concerned, since there are, you know, some people consider being high a side effect. Yeah. So since you can just avoid any inherent risk of that by administering the acid, it just seems like that should be. Rather than just the session of the Yeah. Are, are there any clinical indications, Clara, that the plant high in THC is preferable to what high in CBD? There may be some. Uh, and uh, I would think uh, maybe certain neurological conditions, uh, uh, the famous case of Steve Covey, his cancer, a, a very rare adrenal cancer, that seems very appropriate, a high THC uh, for him. but. Uh, there might be also some uh, situations where CBD without THC uh, is more appropriate for a person, but in general, uh, they, they seem to... We're just at the beginning yeah. of a long march through this data. Yeah. So there's, there's actually a, a lovely paper out in Brazil uh, where they took a, a group of people who had been exposed to CBD and they were For Do you have a yeah, 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 yeah. Go back yeah. here and then here. Did you put in a word for CBD for seniors, by the way? Because <laughs> and, for, <laughs> and for children. This is one of the most important applications of it. Uh, people, you know, have always associated marijuana with youth, and part of that was just generational. It came in in the 60s. But a lot of us who were there in the 60s now are now in our 60s ourselves. And a lot of us, most of us who tried it then, gave up marijuana for one reason or another. One reason. I have observed is that as people get older, they can't handle the high anymore. They can't function. They can't keep track of things. They can't do tasks. Speaking anecdotally, I know of seniors, including myself, who have tried this half-half CBD, THC, find that this completely eliminates the debilitating effects of the high. And one still has the bodily relaxation that one had before, and the medical uh, relief from pain, perhaps, but my, my head is still level, I can focus, and I can work. Mm -hmm. My view is that this could be a blockbuster drug mm -hmm. for, the, for the older generation and for bringing the baby boomers back to cannabis again. What do you think? I agree, and as Martin was saying, and also, uh, possibly for young people too, it might be a more appropriate uh, m m product. Uh, yes, of course, and there are also a lot of people who don't like the effects of THC. Um, who, it does make them anxious, it does make them paranoid. Um, and in our, our small data collection effort, we found that many people who, who tried cannabis years ago didn't like it, for one reason or another, I want to use it again, either they're undergoing chemo or whatever in their 60s and, and, and senior years, and love CBD. Just, it's, it's the answer to their prayers. I, I think I would be remiss in not pointing out, though, that 
uh, some people into high THC pot also like CBD. Yes, we, you know, and that uh, some, it surprised me in we, situations. We, we at, at Project CBD, our lot, we say struggle against CBD opportunism because there's people and there's some people who are starting to to say, well, CBD is the good cannabinoid, THC is the bad cannabinoid. If only if only we can give, if only we can just ban the bad cannabinoid, then we can let people have the good cannabinoid. We are what we're trying to nix that approach. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the back, blue shirt, and then uh, we'll go here and then here, sir. Uh, I was just wondering about how growing conditions, once you start with a, a genetics that are potentially high CD, how the growing conditions affect that, and specifically outdoor versus indoor, is it more for capacity for a high CD result? I don't, I don't think it matters. I, don't I haven't it's just like growing. Have you heard it? Um, so I've done a little bit of research about it. I'm looking into it for an article in our news column. Um, but my understanding of it is that environmental factors don't influence CBD content. Um, it, THC is affected by environmental factors. But um, you know, it's worth an experimentation. But I wouldn't put much emphasis on it. Um, it for example, you couldn't plant a high THC plant and then manipulate it with environmental factors in order to bring out CBD content. CBD is either there or it's not in the genetics of the plant. So um, harvesting generally, um, you're going to want the longest duration possible will give you the highest CBD content. It, you know, we were talking about the resin. Uh, you know, the more sunlight, the more resin. So the more resin, the more CBD and whatever other uh, uh, cannabinoids or elements are in there. It's, so it's like growing any other plant. One thing about a uh, quick comment about growing, there now uh, the, the uh, labs have learned that you can take a sample in the vegetative stage at, at four weeks and get a estimate of the, you can, uh, you can get the CBD to THC ratio right at that point in the vegetative stage, which many growers are taking advantage of so they don't grow out plants that they're not, they're not going to want to have fun in the end. Uh, yes, ma'am, and then you. Um, I've been working with a new company, Green Sticks, working on a vaporizer based on the electric cigarette technology, and we really want to work to get the different ratios. And I'm just wondering if you've seen different effects with vaporizing versus smoking, if you guys are looking at the different applications. Certainly different for eating compared to inhaling, that I will say. Uh, I found one of the most nicest experiences I ever had with cannabis was eating high uh, uh, CBD. One of the strains, the Omrita strain, was about three to two in the ratio. Just perfect, like like a runner's high. Half an hour after exercise, and you're just feeling right. It's, it's not a buzz, but it's just really nice. Now that might not be your experience, sir, and I've not always had that experience, and that's why we're uh, cooperating with the uh, SCC, the the, uh, the, the these, Side of cannabis should, clinicians we, we should, to encourage people to give their feedback. The SEC has created a survey, mm -hmm. and anybody, any, if any of you uh, find yourself trying CBD-rich medicine, take the SEC, give the SEC your feedback. When we have significant numbers of responses, we'll really have some useful data. Yes, here, sir, and then uh, right there, ma'am. Yeah. So, so pot is illegal at the federal level. Where does, where does CBD fall in? Like if I ended up with a vial of pure CBD, what would be the legal status of that? I think it's now on Schedule 1B. They've been fiddling with it. Um, is, is that right? So they need, they need individual cannabinoids in the scheduling? They're starting uh, to do it. It's all encompassing in tetrahydrocannabinols. Yeah. So there's been a lot of rumors out there that CBD is legal. It's not. It's illegal. Not in the U.S. It is not in the right, right in the U.S. Yes. Um, I have a question also related to juicing the raw leaves. Are there any difference, differences in the cannabinoid, cannabinoid profiles of uh, the leaves on various strains and also differences um, in the leaves of male versus female plants? The ratio is the same, consistently the same, but the, the content, the levels are higher in, in, the, in, the, in the, where the trichomes are concentrated in the flowers. But the ratio is the same. So it's better to use CBD rich strain, the leaves from CBD rich strain. Yes. Or the bud. And the bud. Yeah. The highest concentration of CBD is in the yeah. bud. Yeah. I mean, it's just so like with the THC, you know, in that sense too. The bud is where it mainly is, the leaves, it's there too, but not at the same.
Yes, sir. In the back, this may be the last question. We've got about three minutes okay. left. I think you alluded to it earlier. You plan to make 100 or so cannabinoids and 80 or so terpenes or more and buy a noise. But from a practical standpoint, you grow on your own. Uh, we still don't realize how important the other cannabinoids are, how important we're just now learning about the authorized profession of the terpene, et cetera. And so I think the way to do it is to you know, grow several strains macerate them all, extract all the cannabinoids, uh, terpenes, et cetera, and use those for this only, rather than trying to focus on a single cannabinoid. Yeah. Get right, me some. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say how incredibly important O'Shaughnessy's is out there in the provinces in Michigan, but we can get something at the quality level of O'Shaughnessy's and show people it makes a really huge difference. Thank you. I got another tiny little story I'll try to shorten. In 1968, in the fall, I got gut pain really bad, and uh, I went. I went into a farm just west of South Bend, Indiana, and I ripped off a whole trunk load of feral hemp. And no one would smoke that with me, but I would smoke it myself, and I smoked it for 14 months because it made my stomach feel better, and it was probably the CBD content that was helping me. Probably, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, so any last comments? We're, it's about 1 o'clock. we got about one minute, and we'll break uh, for, I'm sorry, about noon, and we'll break for an hour. We'll come back here at 1 o'clock. Uh, Donald Abrams, Amanda, Sue Sisley, uh, Lyle Craker, a very interesting afternoon, so please uh, do get back here right at 1 o'clock. Last word? Uh, quick last word. You know, I, I refer to CBD, uh, medicine, Malika, and Mythbuster. Mythbuster part is really important. I think CBD has the potential of tremendously expanding the medical marijuana market for those into the market. I'm not into market stuff in general, but I think that it has the potential to expand the user base uh, quite significantly. And, this, and the reason is, is when people realize there's a, a relatively non-psychoactive or completely non-psychoactive version of marijuana around, that means it's not just for stoners anymore. It's, that means medical marijuana is not, uh, not a front for stoners. That means uh, it's not just about THC. The federal government has tried to conflate marijuana with THC. The federal government has argued as much before the Supreme Court. You know, marijuana is more than THC. So it, it, it punctures a lot of myths in that way. We, we can go on, but I, I, that that's, to me uh, means that it has a lot of potential as a tool for social change, to unutilized potential. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Alan.